From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The Texas Senate to quit Attorney General Ken Paxton on 16 articles of impeachment, and the vote wasn't close. We'll tell you what happened and what it means for Texas Republicans. Plus, Donald Trump endorses a competency test, as he called it, for presidential candidates. And you know which candidate he means. <laughs> Is that a good idea? And uh, Donald Trump also attacks Ron DeSantis for Florida's six-week abortion ban. How will that fly in the GOP primaries? Welcome. I'm Paul Gigot here with my colleagues on the Wall Street Journal opinion pages, Kim Strassel and Kyle Peterson. Let's talk first about the Texas impeachment trial. Ken Paxton, attorney general, controversial attorney general, acquitted on all 16 articles of impeachment that went through the House, most of which involved charges of corruption. Paxton had been impeached with an overwhelming vote of 121 to 23 in the Texas House, but was let off just as overwhelmingly in the Senate as only two GOP senators voted to convict on any count. That's two of, I think, 18 Republican senators who were available to vote. My reporting suggests that Ken Paxton was saved by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, and he has a rivalry with the Speaker of the Texas House and fellow Republican Dade Phelan, whom he doesn't like and has had run-ins with. Let's listen to a long statement by Patrick at the conclusion of the trial. In the next regular session, we should amend the Constitution on the issue of impeachment as currently written that allowed this flawed process to happen. Millions of taxpayer dollars have been wasted on this impeachment. I'm going to call next week for a full audit of all taxpayer money spent by the House from the beginning of their investigation in March to their final bills they get from their lawyers. Interesting to me, Kyle, that Lieutenant Governor Patrick there in his whole statement never once mentioned the behavior of Attorney General Paxton. He only talked about the process of impeachment. And he really made this a frontal assault on the House and the Speaker. I think that was also notable, the conspicuous absence of any information, any views from the lieutenant governor there on the substance of the allegations. And remember, I mean, a few of the things that were in the House charges, it was that the attorney general released some law enforcement records that he hoped would help a real estate donor, Nate Paul. The House also claimed that Nate Paul funded a renovation of the attorney general's home and hired a woman that Paxton was having an affair with. And on those questions, apparently Dan Patrick has nothing to say. I think it is a conspicuous absence, and it does suggest that some of what's going on here is local politics. It's a pressure cooker environment, I think, in one of these one-party states and these one-party legislatures, and a little bit of jockeying between putative Republican leaders in Texas, the head of the Senate, the head of the House. People don't like each other, have histories and grievances. And from my view, it's just unfortunate that it gets in the way of a real reckoning with these allegations brought by the House. Yeah, the allegations, in my view, Kim, were actually quite serious. They were brought after a long investigation by the House. It wasn't as if they uh, didn't look at this. And I guess the best defense could be, well, he was elected by the voters last year, and it should be a high bar to be able to impeach somebody when you've just been elected. Some of these charges were vetted. Uh, Not all of them and not in any all the detail were vetted during the election, but accusations of corruption against Paxton were there, which he denied and continues to deny. There was also a fair bit of national politicking on this. You had uh, Donald Trump support Paxton. You had Ted Cruz, the Texas senator, support Paxton. And a fair number of the populist conservatives were in favor of, this was the Bush dynasty trying to get revenge against Paxton because Paxton had beaten George P. Bush, who was Jeb Bush's son in the primary last year for the AG. My own reporting suggests that any hint that the Bush dynasty isn't all that powerful anymore in Texas (laughs) isn't real. But it's a talking point that there's no question that a fair number of Texas 
conservatives like to use. Yeah, I think that this is the pity and it goes back to the lack of any of the specifics in that statement that we listened to, because unfortunately what this case became was a kind of symbol of a divide within the Republican Party between those who like to suggest that there's an establishment and then those that would suggest that there's a real conservative movement. Never mind that the lines between those often get blurred. So not only did you have, as you know, national politicians weighing in on this, you saw that divide very much going on in Texas, too, where the entire question of Paxson's behavior and his guilt or innocent was subsumed by these bigger fights that have been going on, in particular between Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, uh, who presided over the Senate, and Dave Phelan, who is the head of the House Republican Party. And they have feuded for years over criminal justice reform, over property taxes, over school choice in particular. And there's a a kind of view among more conservative Republicans that the House has not gone far enough on places. And there's a lot of personal animosity, it would seem, between Patrick and Phelan as well, too. And you saw that in that statement in that not only are they not going to impeach Paxton here, but it now looks as though the Senate is going to turn its attention, government in Texas is going to turn its attention to investigating the House and its own behavior (laughs) and what they did here and whether there was a misuse of public funds. So the whole thing is now so many steps removed from the question of Ken Paxton and what he did. It's really quite remarkable to see. It's a circular firing squad, which is becoming very common among Republicans nationwide. And of course, in Texas, Republicans dominate statewide offices in addition to the legislature and have for some time. And what you get in these state capitals when you get this dominance by a single party is that all of the significant debates really start to happen inside that party. The Democrats are kind of irrelevant in some basic sense, except insofar as if they could threaten Republican hold on the legislature or statewide offices. Now, we saw a couple of years ago that Beto O'Rourke came close within three percentage points of beating Ted Cruz. So the Republicans are not as far ahead in Texas, Kyle, as uh, the Democrats are, say, in California or Illinois or Albany, New York where they really are one party, almost unassailable. In Texas, the Republicans have to be wary because you got millions of new people flowing into the state, both from other states and from foreign countries. The demographics are changing. And if you get a reputation as a ruling party for winking at corruption, that can trump ideology or policy if it becomes too glaring. Right. And you can already see some of the demographic change happening in the politics. These big statewide races getting closer, the local politics and the district politics in the big cities in Texas resemble the politics in big blue cities anywhere else. And so I do think that that is a significant danger for Republicans. I mean, part of the dynamic that I think people forget about these one party states is exactly what you've said. A lot of this gets blamed on gerrymandering, that one party has such total tight control on a state capital. But part of the dynamic is once they take that control, the opposition party sort of atrophies. You end up having the Republican Party of California or the Democratic Party of Texas. But this is the kind of thing that can, as you said, overcome that, I think. I wouldn't be surprised if you hear a lot about that in the elections to come from Democratic candidates, that you have to put Democrats in charge because Republicans charge their own guy with this kind of stuff. Having a campaign donor who hired allegedly the extramarital affair partner of the attorney general and was impeached on that basis and then was overwhelmingly acquitted. And I think that that is a message that is potentially appealing to independent voters, to centrist voters, but even some Republicans who just get fed up with the way that the capital ends up working. Yeah, you really don't want to get a reputation of your Texas Republicans for being the Austin version of the Albany, Springfield or Trenton Democrats. Yeah. And by the way, if they think that this has now drawn a line under this and it now just goes away and we can all get along and people can forget about it, that's not going to happen. I mean, first of all, I just mentioned that, you know, you have Dan Patrick suggesting that they're now going to investigate the House. You've got any number of uh, super conservative groups in Texas who have already vowed to primary anybody who voted to impeach Paxton. 
back in the House and anyone who voted to convict him in the Senate. So there's going to be that going on. You know, there's also now a federal investigation into Baxton's behavior. There's a state bar complaint that continues to be ongoing. There's a whistleblower lawsuit. So, you know, they might have drawn a line under this in terms of the immediate politics, but this is going to be a scandal, if you want to use the words, that follows the Texas Republican Party around at a time when, as you know, it's very important that they look as though they're actually accomplishing the people's business. 